I can talk to you guys today about threads, doing threads in Ruby, doing threads generally, thread synchronization, any problems with thread programming. Um, so here's a little example of how you actually use the start up start the thread in Ruby. Uh, you create an instance of the thread class with thread.new, pass it a block. Inside of the block is the body of code, the thread. Um, and that's you know, pretty much how you create a thread. Um, now that's good. Uh, so, so that's what you need to know, right? It's everything there is to know about threads, right? Well, there is also another little problem, which is uh, the waste conditions. Because threads, unlike processes, are, um, you know, they're, they're like processes in that they're independent threads of, threads of execution. But unlike processes, they actually share uh, memory with all the other threads in the program. Um, so you have to make sure that um, uh, you don't have two threads modifying the same piece of memory, modifying the same object at the same time. Um, if that does happen, you have what's called a race condition. Um, and at least 90% of uh, doing thread programming is avoiding race conditions. Um, so I'll we'll skip these slides and come back later. So race conditions. Um, two objects, two threads modifying the same object at the same time will cause a race condition unless, unless um, it's one of the very few uh, objects which are designed to be used for multiple threads um, in uh, the Ruby standard libraries, there's exactly four types of objects that can be used safely for multiple threads at the same time. Um, those are mutex, queue, size queue, and condition variable. Um, if you're not using one of those, you're going to have a problem. See, like right here, this is an example of a race condition. And there's going to be a problem here, eventually. Um, we've got this shared object, A. Um, it's being used by both of these threads. And we imagine that you know, this, this array uh, contains uh, field names. Um, uh, and so what you want to end up with is uh, the names uh, near each other, presumably. So John and Jones should be right next to each other, Sam and Sam should be right next to each other. Um, but uh, if you do it this way without any kind of synchronization there, uh, you might well end up with this situation um, where the first and last names are not adjacent. Um, um, and that could happen if you have a context switch right at this point, after the first thread will push to the first name and force push the last name. Um, this is kind of a toy example, but it's, uh, it's a good one to uh, uh, show a different synchronization mechanism and how we use those to uh, resolve this problem. Um, uh, so let's see. Oh, well, before I do that, I'm going to say a few things about threads in Ruby generally. Um, um, Ruby threads, you know, unfortunately, they're not really that good. Um, in 1.8, um, we had green threads, which is to say the interpreter had its own notion of threads independent of the operating system threads. Um, and, and that's, you know, usually green threaded implementations tend not to be as good as the ones you get from the operating system. Um, in 1.9, Ruby's actually using the native threads API, but from the user perspective, it's much the same situation. Um, with with, uh, with 1.8, because it had green threads, you ended up only using one CPU on multi-core system. Um, you couldn't, it, it didn't have the, uh, the ability to actually use more than core. Um, in 1.9, it's using native threads, so you'd think it would be able to use multiple cores, but it's not because the interpreter itself is still not re um, And so, uh, and so uh, 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 there's this big um, lock, uh, which every thread has required before it can do anything. Um, and contention for that block ensures that um, no, uh, uh, no, no more than one thread can run at once. Um, uh, so I, I, a lot of what I'm going to say applies to both Ruby 1.8 and 1.9. 1 
from a user perspective, unless you're maybe writing a C extension, um, it, it looks pretty much the same. 1.9 threads might perform a little better. Um, uh, now, Python has the same problem. They also have this global lock. Um, and, they, and it's been that way for a long time with Python. In fact, uh, over, I think over 10 years ago, uh, someone tried to get rid of it, and um, they managed to make the interpreter work without the global lock, but the result was, was so much slower, even so, that that change got backed out. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's not going to be an easy thing to fix. I think we are going to get there with Ruby eventually. Question? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's basic, but what exactly is t1.join doing there? Oh, the joins. Um, so um, so what, what that means is uh, whatever call, thread called join will um, wait until the other thread is finished, thread that's joining is finished. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, if, if that thread, uh, whatever the value of the last expression evaluated by the thread was, will be returned by join. Um, which is kind of a nice little communication mechanism sometimes. So that's just, it's a blocker waiting for the, the thread to end? It's waiting for the thread to end, yes. Okay. Um, the other thing that the join is useful for, um, if, if the thread is joining ends up normally, um, if it raises an exception and that, and that got raised up past the highest level on the thread, um, that exception will get propagated to the call when we call join. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Thank you. Um, uh, so threads on, on Ruby run MRI at any rate suck um, because you can't use multiple cores. Um, you can use um, JRuby, which has native threads and doesn't have the lock problem. Um, so you can't actually use multiple cores with threads on JRuby. This is one of the big selling points of JRuby. Um, another possibility, if you really need to use multiple cores, is, is to use processes instead of threads. Um, where threads will help you um, is not for CPU bound problems, but um, uh, if you have an I.O. bound problem or network bound problem specifically, um, uh, using threads will, um, will, will make that better uh, because uh, the, uh, the global lock does actually get released uh, by a thread that's waiting on some kind of I.O. operation. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there are other miscellaneous uses. It's like uh, if you're waiting for an external process to finish or something like that, it's more or less an I.O. I.O. bound uh, problem. Uh, all right, what's next? Uh, so this is a race condition. Um, and there are various ways of solving race conditions. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of mechanisms. Uh, first few mechanisms I'm going to talk about are, are low-level mechanisms, which aren't uh, generally recommended for um, everyday use. Um, and I'm just go over them real briefly. There's critical sections. Um, there's an example of using critical sections. Um, critical section stops all of the threads uh, until you end the critical section. Uh, uh, another mechanism that some that exists in some systems. Ruby doesn't actually have this, but I think it should, is thread suspended for resume, uh, where instead of stopping all other threads, instead of stopping all other threads, you just stop the one other thread that you know is going to be using the same resource. Um, there's atomic access. Um, this is usually reserved for assembly language programmers. Uh, you can do it and see if you know what you're doing and get away with it. Um, you can actually get away with it in Ruby. Uh, it's not really recommended, uh, but, but you know, basically the insight behind the atomic access is the uh, instructions are not interruptible. Um, so um, an instruction will continue executing when, if an interrupt comes in in the middle of a, 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 a CPU instruction. Um, and then the interrupt won't actually get handled until the instruction has retired. Um, and since thread switches are always one way or another based off of someone's interrupt coming in, Usually, timering up would be something else if the keyboard interrupt. Uh, that means that uh, uh, if you can get the synchronization work that you need to do 
crammed down into a single CPU instruction. You can use that as a synchronization mechanism. Um, so here's some examples of some things you can do in C that uh, are usually end up being atomic, um, though sometimes it depends on the platform. This last one actually isn't a single atomic operation. It's two atomic operations, one read, one write. Um, and these also, it turns out, are actually atomic in Ruby as well. Um, uh, but for a different reason. Um, so, you know, one trick that I've used sometimes in the past is you can have uh, an integer counter variable, and you can actually write to that, you can increment that variable in multiple threads without synchronization and get away with it. You'll end up with the right count at the end. Um, but it's not, it's not exactly kosher to do that. And it, and it probably doesn't work like on JRuby, it might not work in the future. Um, another synchronization mechanism that you see sometimes used is sleep. Um, I talked about critical sections and so forth. I said no, not recommended for ordinary use. Sleep is not recommended at all. Um, but nevertheless, you do see it used. Um, the idea with sleep is um, uh, one thread just goes to sleep for some amount of time and hopefully whatever other thread is running will finish doing whatever it was while first thread was sleeping. Um, now, you know, when you're designing reliable software, you don't want to have the group, hopefully, anywhere in your behavior description. <laughs> yeah, a question? I understand why this is a bad practice, but why is the critical section not recommended? Why is the critical section not recommended? Um, there's a number of reasons. So, uh, one reason has to do with um, the latency. Um, so you're stopping all other threads in the critical section. One of those other ones could be doing something important. Um, there's a portability issue. Critical sections don't work on all systems. In fact, I just went real briefly through the uh, example implementations I had for those. But on a, a multi-core system, implementing a critical section is kind of tricky. Um, and um, a lot of operating systems, like Linux, for instance, don't actually have critical sections. Um, it's not part of the POSIX API. Um, uh, there's some other reasons. What are the other reasons? I have to, before we get too far away from atomic stuff, too, I have a... Um, yes? I, in the past, I've used the, the system called move of the file. Um, right. And that has, in my experience, been universally atomic across at least Solaris and Linux systems. I'm just curious if you have any knowledge of whether that would work in Ruby. So the question was if the system call move is, um, uh, is atomic, basically. Um, I believe it would be. I you know, haven't, haven't looked into that. Um, um, I, it's kind of esoteric, I realize. Well, it, that's a pretty good question. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it probably says something about that in the uh, POSIX uh, API uh, description for move. Um, um, uh, so I'm guessing that uh, the, the kernel guarantees at least the appearance of atomicity uh, when you call move um, so that um, you know, if you're moving multiple files into the same directory, um, they'll end up at different different points in the directory. They'll, they'll end up with different, they'll not use the same durant, right. um, basically. So you won't, um, and, and that would be important for um, uh, file system consistency. Um, you could end up with a bad file system if that weren't the case. Um, so presumably they, they've made that, to, uh, uh, they've made that a safe operation. Have any other questions? Um, all right, let's see. I think I'm going to go on at this point. Um, so don't use sleep. Um, there's another mechanism that you sometimes use, see used for synchronization signals. Uh, these could be like regular Unix signals using the signal API, or it could be other things that are not standard Unix signals but resemble them in a lot of ways. Um, but either way, you run into the same problem. 
signals are like these ephemeral messages that are sent between between threads or between processes. Now, it, for an interprocess communication mechanism, signals are actually um, decent for, for some things. They're limited um, because there's only like 32 signals or something. Um, and um, on some systems, you also get this like, in addition to the signal number, you get this signal parameter, which is like a 32-bit word, you can set to anything you want. Um, but that's not a very broad channel for communication. You can't cram a lot of information into that. <coughs> and, and, and most of those 32 or 64 signals, whatever it is, are reserved for various uh, uh, system uses. Um, uh, but you know, really, the big problem with signals is that they're um, they're ephemeral. If the um, uh, the guy who's receiving the signal isn't in the right state at the time the signal comes in um, to handle the signal appropriately, the signal will just get dropped. It'll get lost, and the information that it was sent is just gone. Um, and and that can be a problem. I actually used to work on a system which used signals extensively as its primary means of inter-thread communication. And uh, it was not good. You know, we could eventually make it work with a lot of jumping through hoops um, to ensure that signals all get delivered at the right time. Uh, but nobody was happy with it. Um, so you know, signals should be avoided as an inter-thread communication mechanism, or possible. Um, there are some cases where they, they might be desirable, nothing else would work. Um, now, uh, when it comes to signals in Ruby, Ruby actually takes a kind of a nice approach to signals in some ways. Um, Ruby forces, forces all signals to be delivered to the main thread. Uh, and this is a good thing, because this means you don't have to install any signal handlers in any thread other than the main thread. And you don't have like race conditions where the signal could come in before you install the handler, or you know, the signal comes in and gets delivered to whatever thread is running at that time, you know, which could lead you to possibly inconsistent signal handling. Um, it, it's just a, a whole lot easier this way, but this does mean that um, you can't actually use them for inter thread communication. And it would kind of actually be nice if there were like a thread signal feature in Ruby as opposed to the process signals. Um, so let's see. Now, so I've talked about some, some low-level, not recommended uh, uh, communication mechanisms. I'm going to talk about some higher-level mechanisms. First of these is semaphores. Um, semaphores are a pretty important mechanism. Um, semaphores are basically a lot like signals, except that they have state. They remember if they've been sent or not. Um, so they don't have that like, forgetting problem that you get with signals. Um, so there's like uh, three uh, three important methods that the semaphore class has. There's this signal class where you say you know, whatever the event the semaphore represents has it's happened. Um, this is an example implementation. I emphasize this is pseudocode that gives you the idea of how it could be written. Um, there's a, a wait method which says I'm going to just uh, block me until whatever this signal is. Uh, gets sent. Um, there's also a broadcast method, which is like the signal, except it wakes up all of the threads that are waiting on a semaphore. Um, now, here's how you could use a semaphore to solve the example race condition I was showing earlier. Um, so basically, uh, uh, the second thread wait on, on a semaphore, um, which is the first thread signals when it's done with the shared resource. Um, uh, uh, there's a, also a, a, a variant of the semaphore called the counting semaphore, where you, which you can signal multiple times, um, and it will remember that it's been signaled so many times, and then you know, if you signal it four times, then four threads can come along and wait for that semaphore, and it won't block, um, but the fifth waiter will block. Uh, uh, now, there isn't, uh, unfortunately, a semaphore class in Ruby. It, uh, it used to be the case in older versions of 1.8, I don't think this is true for I mean, the current releases, that you could kind of twist the mutex and use it as a semaphore. Um, uh, 
But this is a, a, a nice communication mechanism to have. It's one that I, at any rate, relate to very well. Uh, so it's something I hope that will be added to Ruby. Uh, one of the current uh, Ruby Summer of Code projects, uh, which happens to be the one I'm mentoring, um, uh, the student is, uh, among other things, implementing Semaphore class. Um, uh, hopefully that, that will get accepted uh, into to MRI at some point. Um, now, uh, so there's two use cases for signals. I'm kind of demonstrating the signaling use case for, for Semaphore. One thread signals to another thread that the is happening. There's another use case, which is mutual exclusion, where you use a semaphore to protect some common uh, shared data structure uh, from simultaneous access. Um, and that use is so important um, and so common that we have special type of uh, semaphore just for mutual exclusion, which we call the mutex. Um, uh, so mutex is like the semaphore, uh, pretty much. Instead of signal and wait, you have um, lock and unlock. Lock is the equivalent of wait. Signal is the equivalent of uh, no, unlock is the equivalent of signal. Um, and, and the idea with the semaphore, I mean with the mutex, let's see. Uh, there's some examples of how you could implement it. Um, Here's how you use it. This would be the normal way to solve this, this particular race condition. You have a mutex that you create before you create the threads. And each thread locks the mutex before it touches this uh, shared variable A and unlocks it afterwards. And this ensures that there won't be any kind of weirdness in the, uh, uh, in the sequence of operations that get done on that. Um, Uh, mutexes in some implementations have some additional features uh, beyond what you see in a normal semaphore. Um, only one of these is actually implemented in Ruby at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, right now, uh, Ruby has an error checking mechanism where it, it verifies that uh, the same thread unlocks mutex as, as the one that locked it originally. Um, because if, you don't, if that's not happening, you probably have a bug somewhere in your code. Um, this is also, unfortunately, a feature that prevents you from using a mutex like a, a signaling semaphore um, by OL. Uh, there are some other nice features that, that some operating systems or environments have for mutexes. Uh, uh, Ruby does not, perhaps will be added at some point in the future. Uh, uh, so for instance, there's deletion safety. So if you have a threat which dies suddenly, you know, maybe it ran into an error condition and, uh, and uh, just uh, uh, that got raised all the way up the top of the thread. Um, the, uh, uh, if it's holding any mutexes at that point, um, you probably want those mutexes to be released. Otherwise, they're never going to get unlocked. And anybody else who tries to use those mutexes will just end up blocking forever, deadlocking. <laughs> Uh, uh, another nice feature to have is recursive access. Uh, sometimes it can be convenient to uh, uh, to have uh, a thread block a particular mutex multiple times. Um, and then uh, and then the system will know not to unlock it until not, not to actually unlock the mutex until it's actually been the same number of unlocks have been followed. Uh, uh, and then the other, the other feature for it's nice to have for mutexes is priority inheritance, which is a solution to the problem of priority inversion. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, there's a couple more synchronization mechanisms to cover. There's condition variables. Um, this is the last. No, it's not the last one. Um, this is another uh, mechanism that's present in the Ruby standard library. Um, I don't relate well to condition variables. They make it, they make people confused. Um, so, like here's here's the uh, I believe I actually took this code and printed it out of the Ruby uh, uh, Ruby standard library, cut it down so it fit on the slide. Um, 
Condition variable is basically like a signaling semaphore. It's used to signal when an event has happened. Um, except there's also this other mutex that's involved. Uh, and it's kind of hard to see why you want the mutex. Um, it's starting, starting to grow on me a little bit. Um, basically, you use this if there's some signal that you need to wait for while you're holding a mutex. Um, and um, and you, you want that mutex to get unlocked while you're waiting and then locked again when, when, the, when the wait is over. Um, that's when you would use a condition variable. Uh, I don't run into cases where I want this that often, but it, it could be nice for that situation. Here's how you could use it to solve this race condition. Um, is, it, is this a lot like the semaphore code I showed? Um, except, you know, I've got this other mutex here, which apparently exists only to be passed to wait for no good reason. Um, um, okay, now finally we have queues. Um, we all know what a queue is from our CS101 class, I'm sure. Um, there's a special type of queue. Now, here's, here's an example of a queue implementation uh, for thread communication. There's a special type of queue that's used for uh, communicating among, among threads, where if you try to take something from the queue um, when it's empty, um, the, the way um, your thread will block waiting for someone else to push something onto the queue. Uh, that's nice to have. Uh, and then there are some, some styles of thread, thread programming which emphasize queues extensively, even to the exclusion of mutexes. You know, there's some people who say, you know, I don't really like mutexes, I'd rather have queues. Um, so like, uh, if anybody's ever heard of actors, um, that's a, a queue-oriented um, style of thread programming. Um, and uh, I don't think you should go to that extent, but it's nice to know about these. Um, so here's an example of how you use it to solve the race condition. Basically, you put this shared variable on a queue, and you have to, and the threads have to take it off the queue before they can use it, and put it back on when they're done. Um, all right, how am I doing on time? How much time do I have left? Let's see. Two thirty. A few minutes. Okay. Um, so there are some pitfalls to doing thread programming, specifically in Ruby. There, there's a couple, and there's a couple that generally run into. Um, so one of them, um, an exception that's raised in a thread, uh, will by default cause that thread to just die silently without any kind of error message or backtrace or anything, and you won't know that anything what bad has happened. Um, this has bitten me so many times. Um, and so it's a good idea generally to do something to, to deal with this problem. Because otherwise, like, you know, stuff will go wrong and just like, oh, scratch head, what happened? Um, so one way to deal with this, you put an, put an exception handler um, up at the top level, right? Um, another way is uh, there's this uh, abort on exception method that you can set for your threads. It's a, an attribute, actually. So you set that to true, and that means that when an exception comes along, it'll print something out to standard error, the standard usual uh, stack trace. Um, uh, and, and then uh, another thing you can do um, is to make sure to always call join on all the threads you create. It's not always convenient to do that, um, but uh, if you do do that, then that means that whatever exception caused your thread to die will actually be re-raised at the point that the join call is called, uh, uh, which is one of the nice, nice things about join. Uh, so another, another of the thread pitfalls for Ruby has to do with the main thread. You know, when you start Ruby process up, there's one thread, which is called the main thread, and it has some special characteristics. One of them is that when it dies, either by calling exit or um, implicitly by falling off the end of the program, all of your other threads die at the same time. Even if they're still running, doing stuff, all of the threads, the whole process just goes away. Uh, so you have to put usually something in the end of your main thread 
to either just put it to sleep forever or join all the other threads or something, um, or this will be a problem for you. And there's some general pitfalls for to threaded programming in any environment, Ruby, you see, your Java, whatever. Um, and one of them is race conditions. I've talked about that a lot, and how you can solve those a lot of mechanisms. Um, another is deadlocks. A deadlock happens when you've got you know, typically two threads, which are both waiting on the other thread to do something before they can continue. Um, since both of them are blocked, neither one is going to signal the other guy. Both of them basically are just going to sleep forever, never do anything. Um, in practice, um, I haven't run into deadlocks all that often. Um, they do happen sometimes. Um, and they are something you have to think about when you're designing the program. Um, uh, uh, but they're, you know, it's like, you know, maybe a tenth as, as common as race conditions. Um, uh, now these two, two problems are kind of symmetrically related. The race condition is, is the result of under-synchronization in your design. A deadlock is the result of over-synchronization. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a one technique that I've heard of that sometimes people use for dealing with deadlocks, um, which is if you have multiple mutexes that you have to acquire, make sure you always acquire them in the same order. Uh, and, that, and that helps avoid the case where you've gotten one of the mutexes and then somebody else got the other one and you for the other guy. Um, other than that, I don't know of any general mechanisms for dealing with those. Um, OK, so another problem you sometimes run into is priority inversion. Uh, priority inversion, this is only happens when you have uh, threads that have multiple priori different priorities. Um, so here's a picture of priority inversion in, in, in action. If you have threads, three different threads with all of different priorities, you know, and initially the low priority thread is running, it gets some lock. Um, and then it gets preempted by the medium priority thread, which wakes up. And then that gets preempted by the high priority thread. And then it tries to get that same lock, but now it can't because the low priority thread is still holding it. So the high priority thread goes to sleep waiting for the lock to get released. It goes to sleep, and the next highest priority thread is the medium priority thread. It goes along and it runs for a while. It's running. Um, so basically what you have happening here is uh, this high priority thread, excuse me, is waiting for the medium priority thread to do something. Um, so it's waiting for a lower priority thread, which is something you're not supposed to have happen. Uh, uh, thread priorities. Um, eventually, the medium priority thread presumably will finish, and then the low priority thread will release the lock, and finally the high priority thread gets to run. Um, but that wasn't what you wanted to have happen. Um, so. Uh, the solution to this is uh, something called priority inheritance, uh, where if you have a, a, a high priority thread waiting on a mutex, which is being held by a low priority thread, that low priority thread gets a temporary boost to its priority at the same level as the high priority thread. And that ensures that the, this, the situation can't happen. Um, so the final um, pitfall for thread, threaded programming is performance. Um, now, you know, we think about threads, this is something you use to increase your performance in your system, right? You use multiple cores on those languages that support it, or um, uh, do things in the background while you're waiting for I.O. Um, so so why, does, why do we have these performance, why will there be performance problems? Well, um, uh, you know, when you have multiple threads, you have context switches. And in certain, you know, depending on circumstances, those context switches can be uh, relatively expensive. Um, not so much the uh, saving and restoring of registers on the stack and that kind of thing, uh, but the fact that when you switch from one thread to another, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to have a pipeline reload. Um, you're pretty much guaranteed that whatever was in the data cache is not going to be useful for the new thread. Whatever was in the instruction cache is not going to be useful. So all those things have to be reloaded. Um, and that can, that can add up to a hit, you know, especially if you're doing a lot of context switches. So context... Two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. Context switches are something you want to avoid, where possible. Um, uh, and and they, they do show up a lot in you know, uh, 
uh, designs that, that are mutex heavy, um, uh, which is some people, why some people prefer to have cues. Um, so what you can do about that, uh, there, there's um, a, a number of different techniques. Um, uh, there's some special types of mutexes um, that you can use. For instance, there's a read-write lock. Um, you'll notice if you do a lot of thread programming um, that a lot of times you're locking a mutex just in order to read something from some global data structure. Um, and um, you know it's actually safe to have multiple readers reading from a, a shared data structure at the same time. You just don't want to have a reader overlapping with the writer or a writer overlapping with another writer. So a read-write lock allows you to have um, uh, you know, multiple readers actually use the, the data structure at the same time, but only one writer. Um, there's another thing called a spin lock, which is useful for um, systems where you actually can use multiple cores. Um, so when you try to acquire a lock, instead of going to sleep and causing context switch, you just go into busy wait, um, waiting on the lock. Um, and if you know that you're not going to be waiting very long, then that can be more efficient than actually doing the context switch. Um, Another technique is to uh, spread out the, the mutex usage. Um, if you've got like, one big mutex protecting one big data structure, which is used a lot, um, uh, there could be a lot of contention on that, that mutex. Um, and you can uh, um, save, uh, prevent some of that contention by making instead multiple mutexes which protect parts of the data structure instead. Now, it depends on your application that may or may not actually be useful, um, or possible, rather. Um, but um, it is um, a technique that you can use. Uh, so that's about all, I, about all the material I've got. Um, uh, so then, at this point, does anybody have any more questions? No questions? OK, thank you very much, everybody.